Hey, how's it going? Just covering the minimize the maximum distance code challenge problem, which Clement presented to a young lady as sort of a Google like interview question, right? Supposedly, one of his favorite Google interview questions to use when he was giving Google coding interviews. Anyway, this was the data that he presented to her and I'm going to offer the Python solution for it and a little bit more of a readable solution. I think she was using C++ and for the uninitiated and even possibly for the initiated that can be sort of a tough language to follow along with. Um, I, uh, that being said, I think she was very bright. She did a very good job. You know, nobody's perfect and everything. But one of the key things that I feel that is important in these code interviews is to make sure that your interviewer knows where you're at with things. It's not so much about trying to be clever or trying to impress them, because if you think about it, they're working with some of the most impressive, clever people in the entire planet, on the entire planet. So you're probably not going to do that. I mean, you could, but you're going out on a limb, right? We're going out on a limb. I'm not trying to single anybody out, but we are going out on a limb if we try and do that. So our best bet is to try and just do the basics, keep things concise, keep them simple, and keep them effective. So one of the things I've mentioned, if you might have seen any of my other little coding example kind of videos, is that you you're going to make a bed that you have to lie in with your code and that's sort of a trick I think it not not like a trick question kind of a trick but it's sort of a a trick that you can use to your advantage where by not presenting the most efficient perfect complex whatever you know obviously least complex outcome but complex code wise by not presenting something like that you're creating a very nice bed of greens to uh, to make your dish on there. And that's what I would say would be most ideal, my guess. I've, I've failed the Google code coding interview before, but I have not passed it, so I do have a taste of it for whatever that's worth. But anyway, so what you want to do is keep it readable for yourself and your interviewer, because those same frustrations you think about that you come across when you're trying to like code and or especially if you're reading somebody else's code and trying to figure out what it's doing you're like ah, trying to wrap your head around it they're going to be doing that with your code although they're obviously highly skilled by working at Google and everything they're also very human so complexity is complexity you know so the art of everything is to to keep it simple to almost explain it to a five-year-old kind of a thing but not quite you know you don't want to really talk dumb but you want to just any assumptions you want to clear up any assumptions so that being said like I said here's the data that Clement presented there's a, a list of basically objects that are blocks like city blocks and on each block has these three types of potentially these three types of locations a gym a store and a school and potentially more types of locations too but for the simple scenario this is what's going on a person's gonna move to a new city or whatever to go to school and they want to make sure there's a gym as close as possible that the schools as close as possible and that there's you know maybe a grocery store or whatever as close as possible so that these are things that they're going to be regularly going to probably on a daily or every other daily kind of a basis so they don't want to have to walk 10 blocks to go grocery shopping or something like that they ideally like to walk as few blocks as possible so it's minimize the maximum distance I'm going to gloss over a bunch of stuff to do with like coding interview specific stuff and just sort of roll this problem out primarily for people who might have had trouble understanding the C++ solution because Python leans more towards a pseudocode type of just plain English a little bit more. Um, but definitely keep those, you know, if you're preparing for a coding interview, you should be reading a lot about asking clarifying questions and all that kind of stuff, which 
I'm not really in the right context to sort of like stress that stuff. And plus I have a tendency to go on for like hours if I talk too much. So I'm going to try and keep this video short as possible. So basically we want to minimize the maximum distance of each one of these things. So if this is the first block coming in, if you think of it blocks left to right, this would be the block on the left. Then the gym, there's no gym on this block. There is a school on this block and there is no store on this block so that would mean that you'd have to walk zero blocks to get to school because you if you lived on that block or were already present on that block then you wouldn't have to travel any additional blocks to get to school but at this time you have to travel an unknown amount of blocks as far as the present data that we'd have if we consume this list one by one the square bracket represents a list an array like and uh, of course these curlies are more of like, especially if you're thinking in terms of JavaScript, this would be just almost identical, very, very close to uh, JavaScript object notation. And so then you go to the next block and process it and then you get a true for Jim. So that would mean that this, this Jim, or basically from this block, I should say, this entire block right here that doesn't have a Jim, you'd have to travel one block to get to this block with a gym, but it doesn't have any of the other things you need. So if you look, there's, you know, a couple gyms to choose from, and there's several blocks that are happen to have uh, school buildings, I guess, on them. And then there's only one block that actually has a store in this example fodder. So basically you're going to want to get as close to this store as possible without getting too far away from school or the gym and this is the obviously the best choice because you have zero blocks to travel to school you have only one block to travel to the gym and only one block to travel to the store um, otherwise if you come down here you'd have to travel two blocks back to if you were on this block you'd have to travel one two blocks back to the gym so if you're going to the gym every day, you're going to have to walk an additional two blocks there and two blocks back. And if you're pressed for time, if you're hitting the gym between classes or something, you know, whatever scenario, real life scenario it might be attached to, then you're going to have to really walk fast to the gym and spend less time. You know, if you're wanting to do upper body or whatever at the gym that day, you're actually going to spend more time on your lower body walking, arguably and then you get there, whatever, you know the story or you can make it up for yourself. And then down here's the requirements. And this sort of lends itself to what I was saying about how you're gonna make your bed and lie in it, is that obviously this, is, this leaves room to expand on the question in case somebody has already, is already highly trained themselves with this style of a question. Then you can introduce further complexity, like he mentioned where you can add an office to it. And so, we, we're not looking at it as just a fixed thing. It's a little bit more dynamic, right? So anyway, that being said, so let's move on to the next step. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I've already hashed out this problem ahead of time. So that's another thing is you're not gonna hear a whole lot of me thinking out loud. And the way that I code, I'll usually skip past like declaring variables and I'll go back and add them as necessary. I won't think up front like, hmm, what type of data structures will I need? until I absolutely need that data structure. Then I'll think about it. So I'll actually start coding beyond where I, you know, even though I'm writing a block of code and I would need to declare some data structure just above that code in order to utilize it, I'll go ahead and start coding until I've run into that corner of, okay, I need a data structure now, then I'll go back and tack that on right above that block of code, if that makes sense. That's more of a, agile evolutionary uh following with like the the yagni principle of you ain't gonna need it because otherwise we have a tendency to create all these class hierarchies and whatnot and that that's just ridiculous we should be refactoring back to that stuff so i as much as possible i refactor back to each and every variable and data structure just to let you know ahead of time okay so moving along speaking of a data structure like i said this one's just sort of coming out Right now, when I was originally coding this, this one probably didn't come out for another block of code or so. So you could just glaze right past this part and then whatever. But just to explain it as we go, this is a current distance 
and what it is is it's also going to be a json like object it's a dictionary in python and this is sort of python shorthand this is being idiomatic which with clement scoring which reflects google scoring on things is that if you are using a particular language you're likely to get bonus points or you know regular points or whatever you want to think of it as by sticking to the the more idiomatic things like if you can do things a little bit more shorthand that a competent python programmer would easily be able to identify then you should do that but just to explain to anybody who might be doing this in java or some other language what's going on here or javascript whatever it's this is like an embedded for loop almost so what it's doing is it's saying for each location in rex so it's basically for each in this list right here we're going to give them a temporary label as loc for location and then over here is what this is going to populate inside of these curly braces it's going to effectively populate that with for each it's going to say set that location equal to infinity is what's going on there and so basically in a longer hand form this this four would be like up here and it'd be like for each and then this would be like indented and nested within that for loop you know what i mean so that's what's going on so this is basically in a nutshell like i said this is just saying for each location in here set instead of it just being a list it's going to become a dictionary so it's going to say that and then it's going to be like infinity infinity and so on but it's it's a new data structure it's not going to it's not going to alter rex or requirements right it's not going to alter that one it's going to create this new one and we're going to call that current distance and it's just going to have you know gym school store in this scenario and it's just going to give them each a, lo a location of infinity it's not going to have multiple deals like this it's going to look closer to this but inside curly braces with key values instead of just values okay and then we'll start the loop a linear style loop and uh, nested fours so obviously the outer four block in blocks for each block in blocks this is blocks right and this is a block so for each block in here one at a time we're going to go through it obviously in the c plus plus and others the older syntaxes you're going to have like uh, an index variable and do the for i and while i is less than this increment i and whatever you probably end up with stuff like that right so this is basically the shorthand idiomatic pythonic equivalent and so for each block in blocks then we're going to say for each location in rex so for each one of these locations right here it's going to go into the block and the location is that making sense and then we're going to say if that block location so if that block location equals true is true so this one would satisf satisfy that then that block location and current distance so and its corresponding one here but in here uh, we'll get the value zero so we'll assign the value zero into that location and current distance and then we'll continue passing that on to the block location so what it's doing is i am since i'm using a dynamic language so languages like ruby python javascript are more or less dynamic languages where you can just willy-nilly sort of alter data structures most times i would encourage that if it's possible you're not allocating new memory or anything I, I would say do it you know and i would definitely speaking of speaking to an interviewer about it i would mention the fact that you have the option to create a brand new data structure if you want so you could say like uh block distances or something like that and then basically do something like this but instead of just filling it with a few key value pairs fill it with blocks of key value pair you know you're basically duplicating this you could even just copy this over right and uh so that's probably what they would ask you is like what would you do and you give them a quick rundown of like well, maybe a little better explanation than i'm giving about how you would basically duplicate this data structure whether or not it says true or false there probably wouldn't matter you could just override each thing 
and you could continue using basically the same algorithm, just substituting block distances or whatever you want to call it instead of just uh, blocks right here. It would be that simple of a change. But right there, what you'd be doing is a little bit of a trade-off because you'd have to allocate more memory, which in this situation on a modern desktop system or whatever, that's neither here nor there. Like, that's nothing, right, to go either way with that. But if you were working on huge systems, huge amounts of data, or not necessarily huge systems, right, but if you're working with huge amounts of data on systems, which at any point could potentially become constrained for storage then maybe you would want to mutate the data structures especially if they're sort of disposable so in this instance i like to keep things small and keep them simple so that's what my first principle i always go by is keep it simple keep it stupid simple okay so right here four block in blocks sorry i'm catching back up to where i was i was on a rant looking around yeah so if, uh if that block is basically, if it's true, then it's on that block. So go ahead and replace true with, with a distance of zero. So what I'm effectively going to do is populate all of these with their actual travel distances. So all the trues will become zero and all the falses ultimately will become the minimum distance that you'd have to travel to get to the next store or to get to the next gym. Okay, and then else if that block location so if that uh that location in the block is false just a second all right is this record okay sorry about that um yeah so if this block location is false which it is right here in this first example then we're going to take the current distance of the location which is right here, and it's at infinity on that very first iteration at least. It's going to be at infinity because we don't know how close the, the next gym is. We haven't gone through the rest of this list, right? So it's going to be infinity, and we're just going to plug that right into the block location. We're just going to say, hey, replace. If we don't already have a count going for that block, if it's false, then um, then go ahead and shove infinity in there because, hey, we don't know. We don't know if we're ever going to, like if this line wasn't here, then we may never have a store, you know? Or like if we were to put Office in, like I mentioned, then uh, their Office will always be infinity because none of our data has an Office in it. But anyway, not something to stress out too much on, but just something to know there. And then going forward, this eventually will um, plug in the, the values because current distance, as you'll see, uh, for instance, like on the next row, when we get here to school, false. So the next iteration through on the next block, after we go through all three locations on the first block, then we'll come back out to here, jump back in and go through all three locations on the next block. And that current distance, when it gets to the second iteration through, that will be a zero for current distance because we stored a zero in there. So, or excuse me, it will be a one because we're going to increment everything after we go through and did what we just talked about. We're going to go ahead and increment and that will be the last thing we do inside of this for loop. Then we'll come back up here. And so now this will be a zero infinity plus one, still infinity. Same thing here, infinity plus one, still infinity. And this will become a one effectively within this data structure right here, our current distance, right? So then when we get here, so that one will become, this one will be true. So we'll come down here and it will say the current distance to the location, which, or excuse me, I'm sorry, it will be true. So it will stuff a zero in there and in current distance as well, which is kind of mirroring it for a minute. Then we'll come down to school false right here effectively. And it will set that current distance location will be at a one and it will set that current block to one. So you see what's going on there? Then this will become a one. This will stay infinity. This will become a zero, one, infinity. Then we'll come down through here and this will get a zero again. It will get stuffed with a zero because it's gonna short out on that true and it's gonna come down and process that line. It will stick a zero there. Same thing here. It's gonna stop on true, the first conditional stuff a zero in there and then we'll come to that it will stay infinity then we get to right here 
and because we incremented at the end of that thing then we get to right here or excuse me right here and now this is at a one because it's effectively incremented that zero to a one it's false so it will land in the second one and that will go into there this will be a zero infinity then it will increment everything by one so now Jim will become two through this next iteration through we'll hit the false come in here the current distance which is in here is now a two because we've been counting in our head as we increment each time and so it will stuff a two in there which is one two blocks to get back to that one and then it will stuff a zero there and a zero here so effectively at this point if i was live coding i could jump back and forth between the REPL shell very nicely in python and show you like as we went but i'm trying to keep it super simple and as short as possible so i'm not going to be doing that but that's another benefit of languages like javascript and python and whatnot that you can do as you go along that's a lot easier than stopping saving compiling and a lot of the uh lower level languages so to speak but anyway so this will have like zeros and ones and twos all throughout here for the most part except for the fact that at least for this uh column right here for stores these will will be all infinity i think there was one other infinity in here too i could be wrong though um because when it gets here it will have that true there um the, okay the other infinity would be right here because that was a false that was set to infinity and then once we got here it was set to zero but we never went back we haven't iterated back through to set that one so you'll have total of these four infinities plus this fifth one right here so that needs to be dealt with because obviously that's not infinity it's one block to travel there and right here you've got one block to there two blocks from there three blocks from there and four blocks from there right so that is where we will start our next iteration our next four blocks but we'll go back the other direction and like i said when i go to do this i'm going to define these variables these new variables right here when i first did this i didn't define those i just immediately was like okay keeping it dumb and simple i'm just going to move forward with the uh the next blocks and i started coding those out but here we go these i mean it's in a small example like this i don't feel like sticking to my guns on that that it's not that big of a deal to go ahead and define some small like almost scalar variables like this you know that's not a huge deal especially since you know you're pretty much going to need them so there's a lot of trade-offs there's a lot of different ways you can do this this is in that keep it stupid simple ideal because it's like well i'm, I'm i am using two variables right there's I could have stuffed them all into one, but then it's like, how much are you gonna have to juggle in your head there? So some stuff is best partitioned, especially if you might use it completely separately in two different contexts and whatnot. But anyway, that just that's just to say, hey, if you prefer some other way, then more power to you, but definitely consider all of those things. Why are you stuffing it all into one? Or why are you gonna dissect it more than I am here? You know, as long as you have a good answer or you could say, during your interview they just like mention that you know like this was just what i chose now i you know allude to the fact that there's other ways of doing it and that you aren't scared of those other ways and that you know there's pros and cons to each choice so the minimum farthest distance so this is basically that that golden number we're going for is we're trying to find out what's the minimum furthest distance we'd have to walk right and currently we're going to set that one to infinity too which the young lady refers to as like int max in the C++ because that's a little bit more of the simple way in those types of lower level languages to sort of get that effect. But Python is really good with just huge numbers right out of the box. And uh, that's, that's what you can do is float infinity and every actual finite value is going to register as below that positive infinity so that's pretty handy and then this best block right here this is actually a tuple it's kind of like a little array or really short list a tuple or a tuple whatever you want to call it is basically it's a lot more like an array in the sense that it's 
or I shouldn't say a lot more like an array. A lot more like the array I'm thinking of in my head, but like a static array, like an immutable and unchangeable array. So if you do change this tuple, then what it's going to do is effectively throw out the old one if I assign it to best block, and then it's going to give me the, the new replacement tuple there. So just something to keep in mind if you're doing a lot of that. If you're going to mutate a lot of values in place, maybe it'd be better to more efficient to use a list. But otherwise, I like to lean towards a tuple. Okay, and what I'm doing here is this is going to be the index value of that block, which is eventually going to be number four, a one based index value, one, two, three, and then four for that this whole block. And then of course this would be effectively the fifth block, but we're going for that one. And then this none will eventually hold this object in it. It will hold, so that way we can sort of have both in our hands at the same time, like the best block, how do we want to identify the best block? Do we want to identify it by a one based index value, which is more of just like a quick human thing to look at it as? Or do we want that actual block object to be able to hand it off to something? So right here, I'm keeping it simple, but yet making both of those options instantly available. So pretend maybe like I haven't even set those yet if you want. Okay, so here's another, this is that next for loop. So there was the first one and here's the next one. And like Clement was saying, uh, he would have broken it out into right to left, left to right, and then a fine minimum index type of a function thing. So what th what I call this is coding against the rail because you can see what I'm doing here is I'm coding, there's no space between, you know, that, uh, this four and this left rail right here. Of course, there's space right here. But when you're doing that, if you're actually coding inside of classes and functions and stuff, you'll never really be against that rail unless you're like a class or a function name or definition or whatever, right? So I call this coding against the rail. It's something you can do in scripting languages like uh, Python and JavaScript, for instance. And this is how I, I code stuff out. Then I'll go back, like I was saying, I'll refactor later, do everything as a straight, simple, monolithic-like thing, and then go back and chunk it out as necessary. So the first step to dissecting stuff into functions is, especially once you go back and you review it, and you're like, okay, what was this doing again? Oh, okay, it, it's, uh, it's parsing the blocks from left to right, so to speak, conceptually from left to right or top to down, however you want to think about it. And uh, that's basically, holistically, that's what it's doing, right? So what we could do is add a comment here and we could say parse blocks left to right, right? But uh, one thing I might, I would suggest that is a way that you can avoid you can do this the quick and simple way like I'm doing it here linearly without overthinking data structures and functions and stuff like that right out of the box until you see them until they're deemed necessary and then instead of doing that uh, instead of doing that uh, refactoring to a function right here do the comment first which is the first step is to comment your blocks of code so you know what they're doing right as little as possible only as necessary comments are a code smell but that doesn't mean that they're always bad it just means like do you need a comment should you be refactoring instead can you make your code more legible things like that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say not write the comment here but come up with a function name right here so we'll just say to keep it simple left to right so right there, not only have I commented what effectively what's going on, I've used somewhat well-named function for first grab out of the bag. And it's showing that I not only know to comment that code to, you know, I'm instantly making that easier for my interviewer to see what's going on. So that's one less question they have to ask and less frustration for them. But also I'm demonstrating that I would refactor that out potentially out to a function. So there's that, and then I could do the same thing. You know what, actually to really keep that um, in line with that idea, we know we need a current distance. I think I do use current distance later, so I would leave that outside. But for now, I would just like, you know, it's just something you could just mention in conversation as well, and you could, 
you know, if he felt more comfortable doing that right out of the gate, because we haven't justified that we'll need current distance outside. And we could always pass it in, you know, you can pass in variables, whatever. Do whatever you feels accurate and could um, demonstrate the, that the best. So best block and maximum farthest, minimum furthest distance. If I wanted to, I could um, do the same thing here. And then we're going right to uh, left. But you know what, I, for me personally, when I was thinking about it earlier, I was having different thoughts, but I'm gonna go ahead and just do this for now. Don't waste a whole lot of time with it, you know what I mean? And then you come in here, so right to left, and we even if these are defined outside of the function, we could still, in theory, pass them in, like best block and, you know, like whatever, we could do stuff like that, so. Stuff that could be alleviated with a simple Q&A on the subject without having to refactor all over the place. Okay, so for for each index and block in the enumeration of the blocks reversed, that's what's going on there. Python, if you're familiar with it, it makes it nice and short and beautifully sweet on one line. If you're not familiar with Python, it might seem a little bit crazy because this would normally be um, some a few little tiny blocks of code or whatever but what's going on is we're taking blocks we're taking this blocks data structure up here and we're going to reverse the index values of it or yeah basically reverse the iteration I should say of it which is a high level iteration I don't want to get too much into that right now but you can look it up for yourself and then we're going to enumerate and enumerate is kind of like it's a combination of, you know, how right here you can say for block in blocks, and then it will pull out each block object and stuff it in block for an iteration through here. So that's what's going on with this block, just like above right here. But also, it could be to our advantage to have that index value for at least one line of code in the future. So we can use the handy dandy for each construct with that and then at our leisure if we need like oh you know what for this one thing the index value would be handy well up here we didn't have an index value but this this enumerate spits us out a tuple effectively and we're destructuring that tuple into two separate variables right here and that's what's going on right there and then here's another one of those variable assignments like I said I'm giving that ahead of time even though I would have refactored back to it but for this location it is the within each block we're going to reset that furthest location to a zero and then between gym school store we're eventually going to effectively process each one of those and see if it's further than our uh, our current farthest location so that's what's going on there or will be going on there okay so then we get down here and so for location in rex which is just like this Basically, so far, as far as we've implemented, it's exactly the same thing right here. We just have this little enumerated I thing there and this declaration that we haven't even seen how we're going to use yet. So other than that, what we're actually using so far is identical to that virtually. Okay, so for location in Rex, so for each one of those locations in here, gym, school, store, we are going to, instead of increasing the current distance we're going to decrease it and we're going to do it early instead of we're at the end of this nested for loop here we're doing it at the beginning of this nested for loop and the main reason behind that is because i don't like to like take a whole statement out here to like reset the distances which is something you could do right and that was something i did consider but i like to keep it concise especially if i can do it on the fly and it's not that big of a deal there's usually a concise sort of generally idiomatic way to do things like this and that's kind of what I'm doing here because if you think about it this current distance went one too far because on the very last iteration through here we were done but then it's still to get out of that for loop instead of pitting some conditional here to check if we're done and you know not iterating this one past or something tacky I just went ahead and let it iterate one past 
and then by coming in here and knocking that one passed off right away that works you know what i mean then we're back to where we should be and we can just continue on through the whole sequence like this and everything will work but the one thing with the way that i'm doing that is if you're probably already knowing is that you'll end up with negative numbers so that's why right here when i do this test if it's um what i'm doing now is testing if the current distance of the location is less than the block location so we're testing if uh we'll be out here and we'll come back in and then we'll say uh kind of lost where i would be at in the iterations with this specifically but we're checking to say hey is the current distance um so this would have been two zero zero and then it would have gone one past and become three zero uh three one one right so when it comes in here on the first one it's going to come in on jim and that's going to be a three and then it's going to knock that down to a two right there and it's going to say okay is that two and that's an absolute zero in case it goes or an absolute value in case it goes below zero and becomes negative we can still get the same effect um is that two less than the current block location because here's location here's the block we're on so it's going to come in here and this will have been a two and so this is a two and current distance is a two so no the answer is it's not less than it's actually equal so we'll just ignore it in that case right but if it was if it did happen to be less then what we would do is we would say okay in that block location stuff that current the absolute value of that current distance location and i do realize there's a slight uh pre reprocessing of um, absolute values happening twice and of course we could do absolute value just above and say current distance location equals absolute value of current distance location but the problem with that is that throws off our whole thing right here where we're doing this decrement by one and it just introduces these other less elegant code complexities so it's a relatively small calculation to make it's not huge processor wise that would be an optimization so the first thing you always want to do is get something working first then go back and optimize and this is another one of those things where you're making your bed all nice and pretty and you can for in my opinion this is keeping it simple keeping it pretty and this will be fodder for how what if they did want you to optimize it then you could go back and explain oh yeah what i would do you know i would do this i would create a second variable a throwaway variable so that i could still use this and um you know something along those lines or maybe if you come up with a better solution please let us know you know me and everybody else in the comments all five or ten people who might watch this video all right so that's what's going on there and it's only twice like if you can just do sort of a slight duplication like twice that's like uh yeah it's starting to be like it's a code scent i wouldn't say it's like a smell but anyway um that's my reasoning behind that so that will stuff that absolute value in here should that condition be true which in our first example it isn't and then as a separate if regardless this is an else this is an if if location is greater than farthest location maybe i should have done an else if there but this works either way um yeah i would say that should be an else if there an elif like this one yeah and that would just you know either way it will work because it, it you know if this is true then this one's not going to be true so that's why i didn't run into some weird error that made me notice that i had done that but uh if this one's true then there's no reason to really process this one. Oh no i'm wrong this is a totally separate thing this does need to be a separate if sorry my eyes get a little bit glazed over sometimes when i'm trying to stare at code and run through it i i actually typed this out yesterday evening and then now well, you know almost 24 hours later i'm going through it so i'm not quite as familiar with it as i was at that moment but anyway um this is a whole separate thing here as you probably could tell and it's saying this is a separate test that that's that one thing that's all you have to do there's no other like deals to do with that but then 
we get down here and we want to test if that block location is greater than the farthest location, then we want to set that as the farthest location. And farthest location is just right here for each block. As you can see, it's in, just under the for each block enumeration thing. So that gets reset on each block. So we're finding out what is that farthest location because that's the data we're interested in, right? And then we come over here and that furthest location, um, it's just basically keeping track of a max type of a thing. And then if furthest location is less than the minimum furthest distance, which at this point is infinity, so any finite value is going to be less than that. And then uh, go ahead and set that. Go ahead, if that furthest location is less than infinity the first time through, then go ahead and set that. So right here, the furthest location is going to be, uh, effectively, this will be a two. So it will get set to this one. It will get set to the index value five. Am I doing, well, I set the index value down here for best block, like right there. So this is kind of mirroring this right here. And then that gets set right there. But right here on this in-between one, we're also setting minimum furthest distance, which is just one little value on its own, one little scalar value. And we're setting the farthest location, which will be uh, two effectively, right? Because when it comes through here and processes on each time through this nested for loop right here, when it gets to this little if conditional, then, um, you know, for each block, it starts at zero, and then it's checking it, and it will be the two, and then these two will be zero, so they'll it will just skip through and not do anything. It won't do any assignments for those last two locations on that block. It will just effectively stuff that first two in there, and that will be that, and it will come down here, and that will be less than infinity, so for this location will be two. That guy will be two, or gal, whatever, and then best block will then become uh it will become this one but that we're not done right that's just that's the first iteration through and then it will keep going through and doing that same exact process and this one should be the one left in the uh into those variables okay so we finally get there and since i was coding against the rail I can just go ahead and do a print statement. If you were doing a Google Docs style interview or whiteboard, whatever you want to call it, kind of interview, obviously you would either maybe, but probably not copy and paste your code in and see if it runs. If you're practicing, one of the best things you can do is to actually code that whiteboard style, that Google Docs style, and then copy and paste everything back into your development environment and go ahead and run it. But since I didn't factor these out, then uh, there's no function to call and no return value. These are just effectively like global variables and um, we can just print them. So we can print that minimum farthest distance, which if we come up here on the best block, it should be one to the gym, zero to the school and one to that store. So that minimum farthest distance should be a one. And then when we come down here, um, there's a bunch of different ways to print formatted strings in Python. I This was just the last one. This isn't even necessarily the best way to do it. Um, but this way, like this way right here, you can go back pretty far, relatively speaking, in Python versions from where we're at today. And this would work code-wise. Arguably, you don't even need that zero there. I kind of go back to like Python 3.4. I'm using 3.8. Uh, for no particular reason other than that's just my current favorite fast Python, fast and modern Python interpreter. And I only upgrade Python every so many minor iteration uh, versions or whatever. But this format right here, you can also use this one and that will work. Um, but they also have this thing called an F string. And so what we can do here is take this variable value this is a more modern way, but this is only like, I think Python 3.6, don't quote me on that, but somewhere around there, 3.5, 3.6, whatever, they added F strings. And so you can say, 
you know, kind of like in C and C++, how you might have like a long wide string or something. Anyway, not exactly like that, but it's an F string and it just allows you to come in here, a formatted string, and then inside of the curly braces, you can put in a variable value or some expression. I think you can do expressions too. I'm so back and forth with languages, I forget what's allowed sometimes. And even though I've been programming in some of these languages for years, I have to go back to the four dummies kind of basics on some of it sometimes. But anyway, um, yeah, this variable will effectively, all this will be replaced with that variable value. So we'll say, it should say number four, because we're going from the one based one, two, three, four to get here. And then this, uh, this best block. And as you can see right here in best block, I did best block one, which this is zero, this would be index zero, and this would be index one. So that's gonna hand us back the best block object right here that we stuffed into it. And this is the length of blocks, which would have been one, two, three, four, five, minus i, and because i was going uh, backwards, right? So I'm starting to confuse myself now. But this does work, so uh, length of blocks minus i, so that would be a 1 because this would be a 0. We iterated through backwards, so this would be the first one we got, index 0. This would be the second one we got, index 1. So 5 minus 1 would be 4, which we'll replace that with the 4, and then it's going to hand us back that actual block object, and that will print that. So anyway, all said and done, I'll hit F5 to run it, save it. And there we go. We have our our one right here, which represents this print minimum distance one. And then the four, the number four, and then here's that block object right there that uh is this block down here, which is giving us this block right here, which replaced that none right there. So that's what's going on there. And as you can see. You might not be a big fan of typing this much for variable names, and you could shorten them a little bit, but I prefer, especially in examples, to just do this, type them out a little bit leaning long like this. Um, two words, I don't feel like that's sort of a medium. Three words is leaning long, one word's leaning short, and a half a word like loc is leaning really short, right? But one of the rules of thumb for naming variables in code is how ephemeral is that variable? Like this index value is not really gonna matter except for, you know, within whatever little block usually. So that's, and it's sort of one of those conventions that we've just been doing for decades upon decades. It's back to the days when you couldn't use long variable names, you know, you could only use one alphabetic letter or whatever. So that's sort of the logic behind that. That's just the convention. And that shows that that variable is very ephemeral. So if we're using i up here somewhere and then we come down here, we don't have this expectation that i is, it's probably got reset along the lines, ideally, right? Okay, so that's that. And then something like block, that's for everything else beyond little index values or something, that's a little bit better because it describes what it is. It's not just b, because you might get down here and you're like, b location, What what is b location? You know what I mean? I actually, even when I was just doing a quick review on this, breaking up the code into um, 10 different windows or whatever to present it. I even renamed this variable at the last minute. I had to go through each window, rename, find all, rename all the variables, and then go back and reorder the windows so I could do that little shrink them down thing and present them like slides to you. But I had originally named this block distance, but I was like, you know what? That's just, that's still too ambiguous. So if you haven't really publish some interface where that variable matters to the outside world, then change it as much as you want. And that being said, if you are going to publish some interface, it's just little real world tips and tricks and unsolicited advice, right? And if you are going to publish some interface to the outside world, take some time and look at the namings and arrangement of that interface so that you don't feel like you want to change. You don't want to mutate an interface. You want to be able to extend an interface and add stuff to an interface, add functionality, add 
variables to the end of it that it accepts parameters, you know, but you don't want to go back and change a parameter that's going to break what the public or what some licensed company or whatever, the consumer, you don't want to break anything that the consumer of your interface is going to be using. But, you know, open for extension, close for modification is the solid principle behind that. So I basically name this current distance because that makes sense for what's going on here. Instead of block distance, it's like, well, it doesn't quite conceptualize like we're at current distance says, hey, through this current iteration, maybe through this loop. That's why I did current distance because that's how it's being used. So that made a little bit more sense to me. Um, these two names, of course, were what Clement used. I think he should have, especially with a global variable, I think ideally he should have called this requirements. He should have spelt it out long. When you're doing global variables, um, the idea is to, to make them long. And by doing that, you're making that name more unique. So there's less likely to be a name collision. And it's also at the same time making it more descriptive. So that would be the polar opposite of like the little ephemeral index. You know, you shouldn't name a global variable I, unless, you know, in some of the older languages like C, you might do that at a little bit more of a global level because you're always going to just use the, You might just declare it at the global level, right? But you're really utilizing that variable at a very uh, local level. And, uh, and you wouldn't want to actually declare I. That being said, you wouldn't want to declare that outside in, in a global scope. You know, I, by saying more global, I mean towards the top of a scope. Know, because there might be eyes being used outside of a function that you're using an eye in and you you know you don't want to run into any issues like that and then within it just you know maybe you want to do blk or something for block that would probably be okay because then you would at least read it block low and then it could be like block loc maybe um that's a little bit pushing it this way when you especially in something like python which totally lends itself to this it's like for block in blocks for location and requirements if block location is true so if you know we know that a block is a block of blocks if the location is true then that block location gets the current distance location which is infinity or excuse me I should be doing right to left because it's assignment then assign the current distance which was infinity a zero and then assign that same value the zero to the block location then if it's false then assign it whatever we're currently at here and so if we don't know what we're at like right here we don't know yet coming through the first iteration it's going to get infinity and otherwise it's going to get the distance from true that it's currently at the current distance to true and then after we're done with that loop increment everything so that those current distances all increment by one because we're now stepping crossing the street to the next block and then right there of course we're just initializing that minimum for this distance value to infinity and we're setting our best block to zero since we're using one base blocks up here we can get away with using zeros sort of like a you know it's a non-existent value so it's not going to interfere there sentinel value and then uh, the best block is none, which is kind of like null. We don't have a block object yet to hand back. And of course, there's our handy dandy comment that tells us this is a parsing right to left function, but we're not gonna, we're just gonna make it a comment for now. And then we come in and we do that whole same thing as above. And this time we're gonna track the farthest location since we will have all the data necessary. We couldn't track the farthest location here because we didn't know if the next one might be true, like right here, right? We didn't know for sure this next one would be true until we actually parsed it. And in keeping simple, we weren't like, you know, keeping a link back to the previous block or doing crazy stuff like that. That's just, that's, maybe there would be some optimization that might necessitate that, but until that, the need for that optimization arises, keep it simple. You ain't gonna need it. All right, and then we come down here, and of course we we start decrementing, which is de-incrementing um, the current distance 
of the location we do that right away so that instead of being one pass we're now right at it we run these tests to see hey now that we're going back the other way if you know coming back this other way we now know the store is not infinity away right here we know it's only one away so if we find those scenarios we're re plugging them in and then we're going to test speaking of is this the farthest location on this block so far because you know while we're in this for each location while we're there we need to check hey by the way before we go to the next location check on the block let's see if this is the furthest one if so save it in this sort of max location kind of variable that gets reset every block and then when we step outside of this for loop back into this upper one right here you can tell by the indentions gone back in Python sort of implied braces if the furthest location is less than the minimum so this more global variable value right here um, if it's less than infinity of course the first time through then we're gonna go ahead and save that furthest location into the minimum distance so I think we know how that works and then since that is the minimum for this distance so far go ahead and set the best block so this kind of like this is our little tally that indicator but this is actually the data that we care about right this is the data that we want to return based on this or on this value so that's what's going on there and then after we run through all the blocks and all the locations on the blocks and check them against the current distances and all that good stuff back the other way we won't have any infinities left there and we'll fill this one in because when this gets here it will be true zero and then it will decrement by one so this will become a negative one for current distances but that's where that handy dandy absolute value right here gets rid of that negative one and it properly evaluates that that you know that's that and then we print those values for ourselves just to check our work Thanks for watching.